Hey, old timers. Actually, I can include myself in that group now. You know, when I started doing this, um, I was younger than most of my patients. Now I'm older than most of my patients. And I still have a lot of patients who are older than me. Um, I have a patient 87. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw him, his 74-year-old partner. I had two other patients in their 70s, and I think I had three people in their 60s. So um, I think, you know, when the story of HIV is told 100 years from now, um, the lives that many of you have lived with this disease for decades, I think is really going to be the story. The courage that many people have demonstrated is going to be what people talk about. So I'm honored to be here. I'm going to um, repeat a couple of the things that Bali uh, mentioned. I'm going to address some of the questions. I'm not going to show any slides because I've, I've reached the number of PowerPoint presentations I can give in a year, and I can't do any more. So I, you know, talk to me again in 2014. So, let me address, you know, maybe the most important question. Do people with HIV die earlier than people who don't have HIV? And the answer to that is a complicated one. The answer is yes. But you have to realize that a lot of people with HIV die at relatively early ages because they don't adhere to their HIV medications they get an opportunistic infection, they die of an AIDS-defining illness. The studies show that people with HIV die on average about five or six years before somebody who doesn't have HIV. But again, if you factor in the fact that some people die earlier than others, I think once people reach an age of about 50 and their viral loads are undetectable, I think that those people are going to live as long as anybody with HIV. It may be that some people with HIV will get more complications of getting older. You know, um, we're all going to get something as we get older. It's inevitable. And Bali talked about the reasons why we're going to die. We're going to die of heart attacks or strokes or cancers or kidney disease, or liver disease, or we're going to be in a car accident or, you know, you know, get hit by a bus. I mean, that's why people die. So it's going to happen to all of us. So what can you do about it? Um, and um, I don't know, what can you do about it? So, um, HIV causes all those problems. HIV makes it more likely you're going to get a heart attack, I think. It makes it more likely that your bones will get brittle as you get older. Uh, makes it more likely you're going to have kidney problems. Makes it more likely you're going to have liver problems. Makes it more likely you're going to get some cancers. Um, but treating HIV decreases the risk of all of those things happening. So people are better off on treatment than they are not on treatment. For all of the problems that are not AIDS-defining conditions, not opportunistic infections, not Kaposi sarcoma lymphoma, the AIDS-defining malignancies, you're better off on treatment to prevent heart disease, kidney disease, liver disease, non-AIDS-defining cancers and bone problems. So you're better off on therapy than not. Some of the HIV medications can increase the risk that some of these things are going to happen also. Again, the risk is less if you're on HIV treatment. The drugs don't cause these problems with the same frequency as HIV does. Now, I can give you a laundry list of the drugs that do that. I want to mention some. The bottom line, though, again, is 
it's the job of people like me to keep track of these things and to make sure that these complications don't happen. So I'm gonna talk about drugs that people are on and you know, don't get upset about it because uh, again, it doesn't mean that these problems are inevitable. It just means that people need to be evaluated to see if these problems are happening. So one of the take home messages, two, the, I'm gonna, two take home messages before I get into the drugs uh, that I can't emphasize enough um, is, uh, uh, well, are these. First, you gotta pay as much attention to other medical problems and not just focus on HIV. I have, I have to take care of people who've had high blood pressure and diabetes, you know, long before they ever had HIV. They do a great job taking their HIV medications, their viral loads are undetectable, but their diabetes is under lousy control, their blood pressure is high, they smoke. And, you know, it's, I'm not doing my job if a patient of mine dies with an undetectable viral load from a heart attack because their blood pressure is through the roof. Um, but I've got many patients who've had problems related to complications of other medical conditions they've had because they're totally focused on the HIV and they don't pay attention to the other medical issues. So doing what you need to do to stay healthy means more than just taking HIV drugs. Second issue is your doctor's got to pay attention to these other problems as much as they do the HIV. You know, people have to be aware of blood pressure. People have to do the screening tests that are necessary for cancer. They need to give the vaccines that Bali mentioned. Um, and some HIV providers are really good with that stuff and others aren't quite so good because uh, that's not their skill. So sometimes people may need to be seen by multiple providers to get the kind of care they deserve. So if I could just say, you know, if, if uh, you take home no other, other messages from my talk other than those two things, I will have done a good job. So in a general sense, the drugs that we have today are better than the drugs we used to have. Some people don't ever want to change their medications. They say their viral load is undetectable. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's wrong, okay? Because it may be slowly breaking because some of these older drugs cause complications. And switching to a new drugs can keep viral loads undetectable uh, and prevent some of these complications from developing, potentially. So it's important for people to not be totally focused on their HIV infection and to be paying attention to the possibility of switching their HIV medications to make some of the other problems less likely to happen. So some of the commonly used drugs we today though can cause problems, tenofovir. So tenofovir you know, is Viriad, it's in Truvada, it's in Atripla, it's in Complera, it, it's in Stribolt, it, you know, it's in a lot of other medications. That drug is really a great drug. It can cause kidney problems. So your doctor's gotta be following your kidney function and should be doing, checking a urinalysis periodically. Uh, and if things look like tenofovir is causing a problem, switch to something else. Tenofovir can also decrease your bone density. It tends to go down a little bit, and then it doesn't really change after that. It stays pretty flat. So what does that mean? That means you know, your doctor has to pay attention to uh, uh, you know, your vitamin D level, uh, should be saying, to you, um, get exercise. The, the things that you can do to increase your bone mineral density or maintain it, the best thing you can do is weight-bearing exercise. It's better than taking 
vitamin D, it's better than taking calcium, it's better than taking bisphosphonates. Um, so get off your butt, you know, go to the gym, work out. That's probably the best thing that you can do to maintain your health. I tell this to every single one of my patients who is sedentary, you know, get off your butt and get some exercise. You want to be healthy, you know, eat well, wear your seatbelt, stop smoking, and get exercise. But we're Americans, you know, we'd rather take a pill. Some of us would rather take a pill. It, no pill does as good a job as eating well and getting exercise. So don't worry so much about bo loss of bone mineral density to tenofovir if you're sitting on, your, on the couch all day long. Get off the couch, get some exercise, okay? Stop worrying about the tenofovir. Let your doctor worry about the tenofovir. Ritonavir. So ritonavir is a common drug we use. Almost everybody who's on a protease inhibitor gets a sniff of ritonavir. Ritonavir can be a problem because it, it increases triglycerides and cholesterol a little bit. Um, and it, it interacts with a lot of other medications. So a savvy HIV doc will know if another drug that somebody may be take, need to take needs to be, the dose maybe needs to be adjusted because somebody's on ritonavir. Most of us, as we get older, will be on a statin. A, you know, statins are these drugs that lower cholesterol. They prevent heart attacks. People who take statin live longer than people who don't take statins. Um, they may work not because they lower cholesterol, but they decrease inflammation. That's one of the properties of statins. And ritonavir influences the concentration of statins in our bloodstream. With some of the drugs, they shouldn't be used at all. With others, you need to start on a lower dose. And some of the other drugs, like efavirans, can also increase statin levels. So sometimes the statin dose needs to be increased to have the similar kind of effect. So it's, it's one of the reasons why um, you got to go to a knowledgeable HIV provider if you got HIV, because the HIV providers know about these drug interactions. The cardiologists don't. Not all family medicine docs do. So um, there is some complexity here. Um, screening tests are really important. Everybody who's 50 needs to get a colonoscopy. They got to get another colonoscopy every 10 years. If everything is fine, if there are polyps or other kinds of issues, you need to get another colonoscopy in five years. Most people don't like to get colonoscopies, but you need to get it. You know, just, just do it. Um, stop complaining about doing it. Stop avoiding doing it. You know, it's just one day out of your life, you know, or you got to get two days out of your life. The night before and then the day, you know. The, the prep, that's the worst part. They knock you out for the colonoscopy. You don't even know what's going on. You wake up, you have a huge fart, and you feel great. That's, you know, that was my experience. Um, yes? Um, here's a specific answer. No. Okay? The only way that alcohol use interferes with success on HIV therapy is when people stop taking their HIV medications because they're too drunk to remember to take them. And 
you know, uh, a common misconception of people is I shouldn't take my HIV meds because I went out drinking today. I mean, I've had patients who tell me that. And what I tell my patients is just take these medications. I don't care if you drink. I don't care if you shoot heroin every day. I do, but you know something? <laughs> if you shoot heroin every day, you know, I still want you to take your HIV medications every day. And there are some people who live a life like that. And that's fine with me, quite honestly. If they use clean needles, I mean, it's, it's not a healthy practice, but we all make choices. And I think, you know, one of the messages, one of the important things which we don't talk about is quality of life. What's quality of life? It, it's something a little bit different for all of us. I'd love to live to the age of 85, but you know, I don't want to live to the age of 85 if I have dementia. I don't want to live to the, 80, to the age of 85 if I have a stroke at the age of 80, you know, and I'm, you know, in a nursing home somewhere, you know. Um, so it's really about quality of life, right? If some people want to drink, if they enjoy having wine, if they enjoy having a few beers, that's fine as long as it doesn't interfere with the rest of your life. As long as you can work, as long as you socialize, as long as you don't drive, uh, as long as you do the other things that you should be doing. Um, so alcohol is okay. You, to answer the question you asked earlier, there are groups of individuals, there are many groups of individuals following people on HIV medications just indefinitely. Um, there's one huge study called the, the DAD study, the DAD study. It sta DAD stands for Drug Adverse Events. And this is uh, the cohort, as we call it, the group of people that are just being followed chronically to understand some of these relationships between taking medications and risk for certain, you know, problems. So um, Heshi said I should talk till 10 after 7. It's, it's 5 after 7. So I'm going to stop now, and I'll just answer a few questions, okay? So, you know, it's, you're right. These things aren't, you, you know, the recommendations that I'm talking about, they're not just recommendations for people over 50 or over 60 or whatever. They're, you know, it's about living in a healthful way. Um, you know, people with HIV are more likely to smoke than people who don't have HIV. People who have HIV are more likely to have hepatitis than people who don't have HIV. People who have HIV are more likely to do drugs than people who don't have HIV. And some of the reasons why people with HIV, you know, have some of these other conditions, not because they have HIV, but because they do these other things. Um, about half of the, our patients at the University of Pennsylvania smoke. Now. We get in, the doctors get, you know, we do, you know, uh, cartwheels arguing about whether people should be on tenofovir or abacavir, because there's some maybe increased risk of having a heart attack on abacavir. Um, but there's an, a 16% increased risk 
in one study for people who are on the back of you. If you smoke, there's a 400-fold increase, a, a, a four-fold, the 400 percent, 16 percent, 400 percent. So if somebody wants to decrease the risk of having a heart attack, it's not stopping the back of you. It's stopping smoking. So, um, you know, it, it's, we have to keep risks in perspective. You know, uh, life is about risks. Stuff is gonna happen to us, and you have to understand, you know, uh, what the probability is. And you have to make a healthy choice. Or you have to, you have to knowingly choose not to make a healthy choice. You know, I think that that's okay. This guy here, and then back to you. Yeah, I'm long term. He said he's survived for 23 years. And I was fortunate enough to take part in a strategic uh, treatment interruption study years ago. I mean, it was a turning point for me. I practically fell in my city. Of course, I didn't start out with extremely low income, the lowest 100. And it made me, I, that made me somewhat of an exception. But I found it necessary over the years to actually stop treatment because. I was too stressed out, and my body was just uh, reacting to the medication and, and other factors. I was wondering how do you handle treatment interruptions? What's your opinion on that, especially for people who are Yeah, so I don't recommend treatment interruptions, um, but if somebody wants to interrupt their therapy, that's okay. That's okay with me, um, and I'll monitor my patients accordingly. You know, um, I, I, I've gotten to the age, you know, where I've realized that I, I got to go along with what my patients want to do. You know, I, I can't, you know, it, my patients are like a force. And I can, I can sort of direct them a little bit, but I can't knock them off their course, really, you know? Um, so if a patient tells me I'm stopping my medications, what am I going to do? I'm going to say, no, you're not. You know, they're going to stop their medications. So the data say that if you stop your medications, you are more likely to have a heart attack than if you were on medications. You're more likely to have other problems if you're off medications than you're on medications. That's the science of medicine. I got to go with what the universe's experience is. It doesn't mean it's going to happen to everybody, but what I do, this is what doctors do. Let me clue you in, okay? If you're a surgeon, you are a high-paid technician, okay? It's like going to get your car fixed, only it costs about 10 times as much. If you, if you are a doctor that prescribes medications, that's me, okay? I am a high-stakes gambler. And the stakes are my patients' lives. So they're pretty high stakes. The only thing I know is odds. If I write a prescription, I know the probability of that working. I know the probability of a side effect happening. If the combination fails, I know the, the probability of the next thing happening. And that's all I, that's all I, I, I am. I'm also a cheerleader. You know, a coach. You know, I get, I encourage my patients. I help them realize what's possible when sometimes my patients don't realize what is possible. People sometimes have failed. I, like, I, I help them realize that they can succeed. Um, and I can do that only because I've been doing this for as long as I have and I've seen as much as I have and I understand people a lot better now than I used to. So that's my style. And sometimes it works and, you know, for some people it doesn't work. I'm, you know, but that's the way I do it, yeah. Here's a controversial question for you. Uh-oh. I love, I want to go to Brazil. Well, I've been to Brazil, Rio, and 
But I want to take a cruise down the Amazon, and Brazil wants you to have a yellow fever vaccination. Okay. Don't worry about it. Get the vaccine if you're going there for more than. I'll give you all the vaccines you want to get, okay? You want a live vaccine, I'll give you a live vaccine. You want a dead one, I'll give you a dead one. You'll be fine. If your CD4 count is 600, my friend, your immune system is basically normal, okay? Don't worry about it. All right? Everybody in this room should get the shingles vaccine, okay? Yeah. Because you don't want to get shingles. I, can, I got news for you. Um, and it's not going to harm you, okay? You know, and if you get a few little, you know, uh, vesicles, you can always take a cyclovir. They'll go away, you know. Yeah. There's been some hype lately about some uh, medications that would activate the sequestered HIV, and then the medications that you're on would wipe it out, so like a potential cure. Can you comment on that? Yeah, there's a whole group of drugs that are being tested for this, and they do it a little bit, but they don't do it enough to cure anybody for HIV. It's, it's really exciting that we're talking about uh, cure and HIV, that we use the, the words cure and HIV in the same sentence without the words, there is no. Um, I think that someday there will be a cure for HIV. It is not going to be easy. The way to think about this is how long did it, get, did it take us to get from understanding you know, what was causing AIDS, identifying the virus, developing the first drug, and now talking about HIV as a, as a chronic disease. I mean, that was like a 25-year conversation, right? So it may take us that long to cure people with HIV. Um, we may be able to do it faster, but we gotta, uh, there's, you know, there's got to be some newer thinking around the problem. It's complicated, you know. If the worst thing that has to happen is that people can take a few pills a day for the rest of their lives and live a normal lifespan, that's not a bad trade-off, right, for having this disease. I tell people I would rather have HIV infection than have diabetes. I believe that diabetes will kill you. HIV does not have to kill anybody anymore. So um, cure is possible, but you know it's a way of ways, and we shouldn't get too excited about it. Yeah. Well, I, there is no cure for polio, so I don't know what happened to your uncle. But you know, a lot of you know people who who acquire polio, they clear the virus, and neurologically they're fine. Um, but a, when we talk about cure, um, we can mean a couple of things. Um, uh, we sometimes talk about it functional cure. What that would mean is uh, maybe there's a few cells in you that have HIV. But you're not, you don't need to take any medication. Your viral load is undetectable. And your viral load is never going to be detectable. And you're never going to need to take medication. You know, and your immune system is going to be healthy. And you're going to die of a heart attack you know, or cancer when you're in your 70s or 80s. And that's what's probably going to happen to most people with HIV. So that's what you know, we talk about. Um, you know, it, it, it's, we're so new at this business, we don't really even understand what cure means. You know, if you have cancer and you get chemotherapy and, you don't, and the cancer doesn't come back for five years, they say you're cured of your cancer. Does that mean there's not one cell in your body that isn't, that doesn't, that's not cancer? You know, uh, well, maybe for cancer, yes. For HIV, you know, we don't know. Uh, there's this one guy, Timothy Brown, you've heard of, who got the, you know, the bone marrow transplant because he got leukemia. 
He got a transplant with the bone marrow from somebody who had a genetic uh, a variation. And that variation means that his cells don't express, don't have on the surface a certain protein that HIV needs to get into a CD4 cell. So people who, you know, it's a small percentage of people out there that have it. It's about 2% of the population. And, these, and so about 2% of the population, you know, pretty much can't get HIV. There are some exceptions to that, but pretty much can't. So he got this bone marrow from somebody who didn't, who had this variation, and he stopped this therapy, and lo and behold, you know, the, his, the, the HIV didn't come back. And he's been lucky enough to be cured from his uh, leukemia, but he needed two bone marrow transplant. Had, he's got something called graft-versus-host disease where your, your immune system is fighting itself. He's not a healthy guy. Some people die of getting, you know, getting bone marrow transplants. So that's not a way we're gonna cure people with HIV. If you got leukemia, you might as well get a bone marrow from somebody who doesn't have CCR5, that's this kind of variation. But, but you'd rather not have a bone marrow transplant, I assure you, you know. Um, so he's the only guy who we really know has been cured. You may have heard of these, there were these two other cases in Boston, people with lymphomas that got bone marrow transplants but their virus has just come back, so they're not cured. My time is up. Your time is up, so give a round of applause. <laughs>